progress. And thank you once again all for coming. Yes, so again, so thank you for coming. <clears throat> My name's Toby Lambert. I am the uh, Director of Strategy and Population Health um, for the ICB in sort of North West London. Um, and uh, the uh, sort of the person with the joy of holding the pen on the overall strategy. Um, they are clearly bringing together lots of different inputs in order to do that. I'm going to spend about sort of 10 minutes doing an overview of uh, sort of the strategy, sort of how we've got to where we've got to, some of the main themes which are in it, and we'll then break into the uh, into three sort of particular sort of areas: um, local and primary care, sort of mental health, and acute care, with particular questions on those. So let me run through this at some speed so we maximise the time for questions. Um, so as everybody will know, um, we or may may know, um, the ICB and the ICS are technically new organisations formed on the 1st of uh, July last year, so just over a year. Uh, we've been set for overarching objectives um, to achieve, so improving outcomes in population health and wellbeing, preventing ill health and tackling inequalities, enhancing productivity and value for money and supporting broad, broader economic and social development. And the strategy aims to sort of lay out uh, sort of how we, both the NHS and local authorities in uh, sort of North West London, will come together to do that. So it is consciously a strategy which spans both health and social care. Next one, please, Ray. So in doing that, um, we've taken many different inputs into the strategy and we consciously started it very much from the work which our sort of local authorities and uh, um, sort of borough teams have been doing through the joint strategic needs assessments and the joint health and wellbeing strategies, which each of our eight boroughs um, sort of each of our eight boroughs sort of produce, so very much rooted in that uh, sort of shared understanding of uh, sort of local needs. Um, that is itself sort of underpinned by a wide collection of involvement and insights of our residents through sort of numerous different forums um, and then sort of brought together and organised around sort of eight different programmes and networks which we have across North West London and you'll be hearing from three of those delivery programmes um, today in terms of the uh, sort of content of the strategy but we also have if you look at the broader strategy um, chapters on sort of Proactive population health and inequalities, cancer, maternity, children and young people, our involvement programme, data and digital workforce, estates and research and innovation. So it's quite broad in what it covers. Uh, next one, please, Ray. Um, so what you'll see in the overall strategy, which is uh, sort of sitting on our website, is a uh, brief articulation of the problems facing our facing our population in northwest London, some of the issues facing our health and care system and how we respond to those, a set of proposed sort of shared outcomes which we would want to work towards, and then uh, sort of six sort of common priorities. Um, I'm not going to go through the challenges sort of one by one because there are quite a lot of them, but I pulled out some of them here. Um, the major one um, which we face is the one shown in the chart on the left here, um, which basically shows that we've been in reducing sort of disability across northwest London um, for quite a while. Um, previous one still, Ray, we haven't moved on yet. Um, reducing disability and sort of ill health across northwest London for quite a while. It went flat about sort of seven or eight years ago. Those of you with eagle eyes will have spotted it's beginning to tick up in the very last couple of years of that chart. So it basically, and that's basically our biggest issue. So done quite well, um, but that looks like it's going into reverse. Um, the data actually stops about sort of, three years ago, which is handily when COVID started, and we've since had cost of living crisis. So middle chart here, and uh, so the right hand side on sort of, the number of people out of work going up sort of, quite sharply. So I think it would be heroic to assume that uh, if we were, if we had the latest data, that um, disability and ill health has continued has started to fall again, and I think we have to assume that it's going up as a result of uh, austerity, COVID, cost of living and so on. If we turn to the challenges our health and care system face, um, we could have done these with virtually any ser service, so I'm not particularly picking on them, uh, but we know we've got issues in workforce. Um, so social care workforce here has been increasing. 
last couple of years has been coming down again. So the gap between what we need and what we've got has been increasing. Um, we know we've got unacceptable variation. So this happens to be mental health care could be anything. And we know that waiting lists have been sort of going up. And if we turn next to what our residents say most strongly, um, you're going through far too many there, just so I know what the slides are. To turn to what our residents say most strongly, the overwhelming thing we get first is access. So, um, so problems with access it has to be said primary care comes out first, but by no means so sort of primary care. So big issue with that. And then those air, those services we have, which are sort of more complex now to hospital, so mental health, A and E, and so on, um, also get uh, shows considerable room for improvement shall we say. So Ray, on two slides now, because I've just talked to the one, talked to that one. Right, so what we've then done is pull together some uh, sort of suggested outcomes which we can work together across our organisations in North West London to deliver. We've started from Professor Marmot's work. For those of you who don't know Professor Marmot, he's done a number of uh, very big sort of reports on how we tackle inequalities so as a country, and we've essentially pulled from Professor Marmot's work um, the indicators which are most helpful um, for or most amenable to work across sort of northwest London to sort of make better. So that costs cover six areas. So children start in life, um, maximizing capabilities, fair employment and good work, healthy standard of living, sustainable communities, and uh, so, uh, strengthening the role and impact of ill health prevention and the next slide gives us some a little bit more detail behind that um, what we've consciously not done is try to incorporate everything which is important anywhere in northwest london because we have many different organizations in our integrated care system um, and many of them have uh, sort of priorities which they are continuing um, to push and work on themselves. What we try to do here is to pull out the areas which could benefit from us working together on to go further and faster. So you may see that, or you may have in your minds things which you think are tremendously important in Brent or in Harrow or for your particular sort of community. Um, if so, please do let us know. Uh, but it may be the case that it's important for one part of Northwest London and they're continuing to work on it. But because it's not something we want to work on together, it hasn't made it into the strategy. So as I say, do tell us, but that may be the reason why it doesn't show. Um, so that's the outcomes. We then move on to uh, sort of six um, priority areas. So that's the hexagon slide, please, Ray. Um, first of those is continuing to support health and well-being, where the area for work across Northwest London is really focused on uh, improving employment in the health and care system for our residents. So you've seen those out of work benefit numbers a little bit earlier. Um, we're also one of the biggest employers in Northwest London, so there's quite a lot we can do both on the care side and in uh, improving access to employment um, for the uh, sort of the jobs which the uh, various partners um, sort of hire for and sort of recruit for. Um, second is then on to addressing the inequalities, and here in particular. Um, we've got the piece on sort of building on uh, the lessons from COVID in how we engage with our communities to have um, sort of more individuals come forward um, for support. So we know that uh, there's quite a degree of hesitancy, particularly focused in certain areas, and it's the how do we build on lessons of COVID and how we sort of address that. Um, third, then sort of improving access. Um, two things here. So one on improving our sort of integrated sort of neighbourhood teams. Um, those are basically teams arranged around um, sort of primary care sort of general practice with a wider range of services in them, which should streamline and improve access to primary care. Uh, but also by being a team covering lots of different services and um, reduce some of the pinging around which we currently see in the system where mm. uh, individuals are, or residents are said, told, try this service, oh, you don't quite fit for that one, try this one, you don't quite fit for that one, and so on. So it should also improve, reduce the uh, sort of complexity and the, uh, the bouncing around. And we'll hear more, a bit, a bit more about that in mm. our first session. Um, Alongside that goes the delivering care closer to home, particularly for those uh, sort of residents who have quite a complex sort of mix of needs um, and how we support those through those integrated neighbourhood teams. 
and working with uh, across uh, social care and primary care and community care to keep people in their own homes as far as possible. Uh, clearly, there are some occasions where hospital admission is appropriate, um, but uh, often it isn't, and uh, people prefer to be in their own homes when they can be suitably supported. Uh, fifth area really is very similar to those previous four, but with a particular focus on uh, sort of children and young people, um, which is hence the sort of right person first time model of care for them and also improving the access to mental health support. And then sixth, um, as much as I we like the other five, um, they're not going to come for free. Uh, we're not all sitting on a magical sort of pot of money we can uh, uh, use to deploy, deploy to, to deliver that. And hence we have to continue pushing on the productivity and the quality of our services across Northwest London in order to liberate um, the funds to be able to push those uh, other sort of priorities. And that has to be underpinned by innovative and more cost effective models of care, strengthening our workforce and uh, sort of refreshing our estate. So that's a bit of a wistful stop through the uh, six different priorities. Um, what you've got coming up is a look at three of our areas, so local and primary care, mental health, and um, so acute sort of hospital care, and how those sort of priorities play into what those particular areas of care are doing. This, of course, is part of our ongoing sort of engagement. Um, that engagement is running through a number of different streams, of which this is one. Um, we've got quite a large number of uh, so, um, so outreach events or in our sort of communities as well underpinning this. All of the health and wellbeing boards haven't quite gone through all of them yet, Penny. We've got one outstanding, um, so at Brent at the Brenton in, in a couple of weeks, but we've been through seven out of the eight. So the input comes from those health and wellbeing boards as well. Um, this and on the next slide, with any luck, yep, we've got a survey you can access through our website. Um, as of the end of last week, I had 932 responses in that. Um, now it's over a thousand. At the moment, the headline numbers seem to be suggesting that we've done quite well on what we've got in the strategy. Um, but that feedback is only part of what we take in. Um, and the survey is open until the end of the week. So if you disagree with this, um, please get on to that survey pretty rapidly and uh, give us uh, your, your input as well. Um, it is turning up a number of things which we seem to be doing quite well on sort of in the uh, strategy itself. So mental health support and um, sort of recognising housing as a um, determinant of, sort of health and the way in which we're engaging our residents. But it's also bringing out a number of areas for, so, so we say, sort of further improvement and um, particularly around the achievability of all of the things in the strategy, um, given the financial envelope we have, and then the need to translate it from nice words into a clear plan of action, which we can be held to account for sort of running forward. So that is all I was going to say. Um, we have, I think, very brief pause for questions on that. Uh, there are a couple of questions that are coming out. One um, was to find out success stories about the co-productions. Another was to do with the funding for these fi these eight areas, whether the funds have been allocated and whether we would find out about those. Also, there was one about um, unpaid workers and how is that captured within the strategy? Um, if you'd like to try and attempt to run through that, Toby. Yeah, so co-production has run through a sort of number of sort of different um, themes. So each of our programmes have had their own um, sort of mechanism for engaging sort of residents and involving them in a, what they've uh, sort of drawn up in their sort of programme bit. So um, you'll have an opportunity to ask that same question to our programmes in just a moment. Um, we have involved a number of residents in the big town hall meetings we've had so on the strategy and uh, we've consciously sort of tried to suck up all of the uh, insight which has come from all of the different meetings across our local authorities, borough partnerships and uh, different organisations, third sector and so on. So that's what we've done on that. There is clearly more co-production to be done as we shift from here's the overall strategy into how practically are we actually going to deliver this so on the ground. Um, on the money, um, we don't at this point have a detailed uh, sort of breakdown of how the uh, sort of the money works against them. Um, 
we are in a position of being sort of relatively confident we can make a fair degree of progress. But any of you who have been anywhere near the NHS know we don't actually know what our budget is for next year, so quite yet. So it's always a little bit of a science. And as we go into that more detailed working through of the implementation plans behind each one, that's where we need to sort out uh, sort of the money set and the workforce. And there was a third question, Deborah, which I've now forgotten. Um, it was to do with unpaid carers and community um, groups. Are, are they going so to be addressed? A, there's a bit on that in the strategy, but it is, is one of the areas which quite a number of people have uh, brought up as a, could we say some more on it? So if you've got, people have got particular things they would like us to put in, again, put that into the feedback and we can uh, have a look at it. Uh, anything which comes into the feedback, I need to take to our integrated care partnership. So that's the NHS and the eight local authorities um, for them to say, yes, oh. we should do something on this together across North West London or actually was, we'll do it all individually in different places. That was unpaid family carers rather than yep. unpaid workers. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Um, and I think that there was a question earlier about just it, it, just trying to um, help our participants understand who is in charge of what. The, the Penny did have a uh, overview of some of the acronyms, but I think that it's it's still um, something that is a, is hard for people to understand. What level are we talking about for the implementation of the strategy? Maybe you could just talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So. Very, I mean, this is one of those things you could talk for hours on, and I'm not going to try and do that. So, but in essence, the way it works is we try and do things once across Northwest London, which can be done once across Northwest London. So, that includes a number of the service, the course or service specifications, and how the uh, sort of money is allocated. And then the delivery is uh, carried out by our sort of individual trusts and coordinated by our borough based partnerships. Um, the other thing our borough based partnerships do is to ensure that we stay on top of the actual needs of local residents because that you need to have the local understanding to be able to do that and to adjust or tailor those sort of northwest london wide core specifications for the particular needs of local populations okay um there is another um i think we get the, onto this in a slide uh, a little bit later about inequalities is there going to be some training special training for uh so that the way one in five i think in the slides say that they are not being treated equally will there be coaching to help people in the bme commute to help people from the bme community feel that they are included um it depends a bit what included in what, but uh, well, for, I think it's just a matter yes. of the the insensitivities that sometimes are, uh, they face within the care sector. Um, yes, so almost certainly on that one. There will be more training. Okay. Yep. So I, where are we in the agenda at the moment? We have time for more questions, or are we going to move along? Technically, we're a little section. bit over, but uh, if people want, people who've got their hands up want to put them in the chat, um, we will ensure we uh, come back to them. Okay. So, our next section, I don't actually have the agenda up, but I think it's the GP and primary care, which I know is of great um, interest to everybody, um, especially access, which has been a constant question. So, over to Kathy. Hello, good evening everybody. I'm Cathy Winfield. I'm the Senior Responsible Officer for Primary Care uh, for North West London. So here to take you uh, through some of the work we've been doing in relation to primary care. Next slide, please. So as you've rightly just reflected there, uh, we've um, had a lot of feedback from people. We've worked very closely with some of the PPGs and with Healthwatch, and we've heard loud and clear that the biggest challenge that uh, patients face is their concern about getting access to their practice. So we're now uh, embarking on quite a lot of work to improve that. There's national work going on about this, uh, which, which we are part of, but there's also, um, we're just starting a big local programme that is specific to North West London. Uh, so some of the ways in which we're 
we're, we're trying to help. One of the bits of feedback we get is it's actually people being able to get through on the phone is a particular issue. Uh, so all of our practices have now had um, new telephone systems or, or have existing telephone systems that are cloud based telephony that enables them to uh, provide callback services. It enables them to route calls more effectively. Um, and it means that patients aren't hanging on. The feedback we got was that sometimes people are hanging on and running up um, big mobile phone bills. So you, they can now get a call back. They can now get routed uh, to the most uh, appropriate service. So that, that's a really important um, extra bit of help for people. Uh, in terms of uh, the workforce, um, we, we can also make sure that we can use that information, that data from those systems to make sure that we match the staff to the peaks in demand. Uh, we can track that much more effectively. We're also employing more staff and I'll go on and talk about that in a minute. Uh, and we're also offering different types of appointments other than face to face appointments, which um, suit some people, don't suit everybody, but suit quite a lot of people. And it does mean that we can um, deliver more care to more people. We're also encouraging our practices to work together in groups, uh, in networks of practices, in which are called primary care networks, uh, to provide a broader range of services than they might otherwise be able to do if they were just operating by themselves as an individual practice. Next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit about the new staff in our GP practices, um, we've actually managed to recruit more than a thousand new staff into primary care services uh, across our GP practices in North West London. And the budget for this year goes up by a further 30 percent. So we're, we're expecting to recruit even more staff in the coming year. And there's quite a range of disciplines that, that we have been employing. The majority of the staff that have been recruited, the majority of the clinical staff have been uh, pharmacists that can support uh, by either offering face to face consultations, the same as GPs, or are, report, are supporting the practice behind the scenes with medication reviews, responding to complex queries for patients uh, and managing um, the uh, safe uh, and effective prescribing within practices. But we've also got people like physiotherapists, paramedics, and physicians associates. Now, physicians associates are people who've done a life science degree and then gone on to do a further two years training, and they work under the direct supervision um, of another clinician. Uh, so so uh, they can also provide uh, a lot of face to face contacts with patients and deal with a whole range of conditions um, that don't necessarily require the expertise of a GP. We've also got a range of non-clinical staff, uh, so uh, staff like health and wellbeing coaches. Uh, we've got people like social prescribers who can help direct people to a range of services um, that will help support them uh, with the full sort of health and social care support that they might need. So quite now a broad and diverse range of staff working in general practice. We're also trying to work hard at um, maintaining and hopefully increasing our level of GPs and maintaining our level of general practice nurses. Um, so at the moment, we've got a very, very slight increase in the number of GPs in North West London. And whilst that doesn't look tremendously reassuring, when we look at that compared nationally, where actually there are reductions in GPs and other areas, we are at least sort of holding our own. But there's a lot of work to do in terms of um, working with the deanery, making sure that we can attract people in from training and they don't train in London and then leave to go elsewhere. And then we're offering people support in their career and that we're encouraging GPs who might otherwise retire to stay in the system a little bit longer uh, and, and perhaps have a, a mentoring and supportive role. So moving on from workforce to think about how we might use technology um, to, to provide uh, more care to more people. So we're increasingly offering telephone and video consultations. Um, we still see most people face to face. Over two thirds of our contacts are still face to face. 67.1 of our appointments are face to face, um, but quite often people um, uh, can have an initial phone appointment and that means that their care can be provided over the phone, uh, their needs can be met. It might mean that if they need a prescription that can be sent electronically to the pharmacy of their choice. And it just means that we can then provide face to face appointments for the people who really um, have a clinical need for that for that service. And some many people find the telephone and video consultations a quicker and a more convenient option. 
We also encourage people where they can to complete an electronic consultation form. And that means that that information goes into the system. It can be automatically triaged and it speeds up getting the right help, the right type of service for the patient. Now, we know that not everybody um, is comfortable or can use that kind of technology. But for the people that can, it frees up capacity for the patients who might otherwise find it challenging or who do need that face to face contact. So it's about having the right balance uh, and keeping keeping a choice of mode of, of contact with with general practice. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier that some of our GP practices or all of our GP practices are actually now working together in groups called primary care networks. And that sometimes means that one practice will take a lead in a neighbourhood. Uh, and the benefit of that is that we have a lot of quite small surgeries in northwest London. Over 100 of our practices are, have got a list size of less than 5,000, which would be considered quite small. And that means that those small surgeries sometimes struggle to provide the full range of services that we would like everybody to have. But by working together, some practices can provide those services for a neighbourhood on behalf of their colleagues and other practices. And we can now be confident that all patients in North West London will now get the same access to the same services. That's been a really important uh, change for us. Those contracts, uh, we started that contract this year and the practices are just mobilising now. Everybody, uh, all of our primary care networks in North West London, all 45 of them start, had signed up to that new way of working by, by the end of uh, June. So relatively recently and are, are now in the process of mobilising and delivering those services. So that will be a really positive benefit for our, our residents. We're using that kind of thinking now to look at how we can improve access to people who need care on the same day. And this is another big element of feedback that we get from people. So what we want people to do is to sort of streamline the way they work in general practice. If you imagine in a hospital setting, you have outpatients uh, where people go for planned appointments. They know they're going to need to be seen. They know they're going to have regular follow up, bookable appointment. And you have emergency departments for those urgent, immediate presenting things that, that need to be dealt with on the day. Often in general practice, we've kind of blurred the two things and people have run a surgery and then seen urgents at the end of a surgery or done home visits at the end of a surgery. And often it's the urgents and the people that need a home visit that are the sicker. Um, but because they're trying to manage that along with a, a list of booked appointments, that becomes quite challenging. So recently, um, the report that was done by the GP Claire Fuller recommended that we separated that activity in general practice in the same way that hospitals do. And then we actually have dedicated teams and a dedicated work stream to look look after people with the same day care need. And that then helps to protect the time in surgeries for those routine bookable appointments and helps us to manage people that have got complex needs or long term conditions. So we've just started a particular programme in North West London to implement that kind of streaming. And we're in the process of recruiting our PCNs to uh, undergo a piece of sort of redesign of the way they run their services and possibly to provide that same day care at, at a neighbourhood level. So it might be that if you've got something relatively straightforward and non-complex, but you do need a same day response, that uh, when you ring your practice, you'll actually get routed to a neighbourhood level service that might have GPs, it might have nurses, um, it might have a paramedic, it might have a, uh, a pharmacist as part of a broad team who can then you know, provide a very much broader response on the day, might refer you to rapid response community services, might refer you to a community pharmacy, might might refer you to mental health crisis services depending on the issue so people are going to get a much more rounded response and a much more rapid response meanwhile all the surgeries are able to carry on with their with their routine work uh, and that capacity is not um, put at risk by needing to deal with emergencies on the day so increasingly as part of that model, our, our GP practices and our primary care networks will be working as part of the integrated neighbourhood teams that Toby described earlier. So working together with services like district nursing, mental health, um, social care and voluntary services. And we'll also see some of our hospital doctors potentially coming out and working in those teams, um, either providing support behind the, scene, the scenes to those teams, having multidisciplinary team discussions about complex cases and providing advice, or actually 
seeing patients in a, in a community setting and out of the hospital. So we're working at the moment um, with each of our, our boroughs uh, to think about how we establish those integrated neighbourhood teams. I was in Harrow uh, last week with uh, all sorts of uh, groups and uh, uh, people from uh, health and social care talking about how we, we move forward and develop those uh, integrated integrated teams. And we again think that's a good way, as Tony said, as Toby said, to stop patients sort of ricocheting around the system and bouncing between services, but to give a, a sort of one stop comprehensive response and for people to feel their their care is managed by a team of people um, who know them and who are providing the most appropriate uh, response to meet their needs. So we're going to get that better coordinated and more local care for our patients. Next slide, please. I'm not sure who's speaking to the local care sites because I know James Benson is poorly today. So you get me again, Cathy. Um, okay. <laughs> unfortunately, people might have to put up with me more than once um, this evening, but I think you've actually touched on quite a lot of the points in uh, so at local in what we call local care already. So these points on uh, so providing more support to the community rather than hospital, including support in your own home, is exactly back into these integrated neighbourhood teams and how we bring a uh, sort of wider range of people to organised around um, neighbourhoods or sort of general practice. Um, in order to deliver this sort of greater sort of flexible support and uh, the uh, um, streams of the mostly healthy and the complex and long-standing conditions. Um, next one, Ray. There are uh, so a couple of very sort of specific areas which I think are worth bringing out more. Um, so there's a sort of particular sort of piece of work ongoing on how we improve sort of early planning and uh, and sort of palliative care. Um, we know this has been a sort of long-standing sort of issue across sort of northwest London, and we are on the cusp of going out with some more detailed sort of proposals on that sort of in the autumn. But it's essentially around sort of better identification of uh, those who would be um, who would benefit from sort of the early planning and uh, support at the end of their life, and a more joined-up uh, sort of offer of care. Um, spanning uh, sort of hospice services, whether outpatient, inpatient, or at home with sort of twenty four seven support and uh, sort of dedicated supported nursing. Um, the next one to pull out in particular is identifying earlier when people have long term conditions. So one of the things we can now do um, with the uh, technology and the data is to work out who is likely to be at risk, because at the moment we have a model which is slightly more based on people presenting in GP surgery and saying, I think I might have something wrong with me. Can you please give me a test and slightly less on the we know it's likely to be you, it's likely to be you, it's likely to be you and reaching out to them. We do a bit of that reaching out, but we could do it more effectively. And most importantly, we could tailor how we do that reaching out to uh, sort of different communities. So that's a, that's a particular sort of thing to sort of pull out. And then so lastly, um, a, a bit of a hardy perennial, this one, um, but it's the uh, ongoing how we continue to support people but at home, particularly uh, those who've had hospital stays. Uh, so we know if you go into hospital, uh, your muscle tone deteriorates. If you're confused when you went in, um, you're even more confused when you come out, and that inhibits your ability to get back home and to uh, um, so, and to uh, so settle sort of back in, so you can get onto the uh, sort of revolving door. Um, if we don't get that right. And how we pull, and this is about pulling on our sort of broader resources, including those integrated neighbourhood teams, to ensure people feel supported. I think we've got a few questions um, from our participants. Um, can I ask Kay Gilby? Kay, if you'd like to unmute yourself, ask a question. Thank you very much. Um, one of my or a couple of my questions um how can we stop and who has authority over doctors to tell them to stop referring patients to the urgent treatment center for things like a chest infection i've got a friend who lives yeah. in harefield shall i get uh, kathy kathy i think is going to answer that question 
Yeah, so you're, okay, you're on the button with exactly why we're trying to uh, strengthen the, what we're doing around on the day, same, same day care. I think when that kind of thing is happening, when GPs ask patients to phone 111 or send them to the UTC, it is because they feel that they have run out of capacity. They know that person needs care on the day. They know they need to be seen, but they haven't got the capacity to do it themselves. That's exactly what we're trying to tackle um, with this programme of having a, a sort of um, neighbourhood level response that all same day care patients will be seen. So you're right, that's exactly the problem that we're trying to tackle with this uh, redesign of access uh, in general practice. And can I ask Merle Vora? if to has a question to yes uh, uh, hi there um i actually am uh, on the patient experience group at, uh, at at the trust and also am uh, doing some work as a pilot for carers for learning disability patients in hospital uh, which was approved by the former ccg my question is a fairly general one uh, i I'm, i was really looking at how integrated care works in this way because the role of for example what happens to an LD patient both in the community and the trust requires me to talk to both sides and I currently have a lot of problem trying to get this thing coordinated between the trust and the community care and there seems to be nobody who takes owners or responsibility of how I coordinate that this uh, this activity and I'm looking at some kind of uh, answers from anybody here, which tells me if I'm having a problem not getting people doing their, their work, if you like, or doing their job, how do I address this? I think this comes to the issue of continuity of care, which was also being Correct. brought up um, by other people on the chat. Would someone like to address continuity of care in this particular issue? Maybe I Kathy? Well, I mean, I can have a go. So I think one of the really important things, I think, is for uh, people who uh, have particularly complex needs is to have somebody that is actually going to take responsibility for managing their case across the whole system so they know where they are in their patient journey. The other really important thing is to have a single uh, care record that everybody can see so that when you turn up at your GP, they know that you were in ED yesterday or that you have been seen by a consultant two weeks ago, they know what's happened, they've got your test results uh, and they know all about your care. So I think those two things, both having shared information um, that flows around the patient, wherever the patient goes, their information is there, but also having um, that sort of proactive, identifying people with complex needs and proactively managing them and having a case manager. So some of the things that, that Toby was talking about, where we've got complex needs and we want people to have more coordinated care are, are the sorts of things that we would be aiming for. But this is a very theoretical thing because at, at the ground level and in practice, none of that works because you know, uh, I'm trying to get this, uh, for example, the urgent care plan as a record, but this is not visible to anybody in the trust, right? So the, the information is there in patches. People don't understand, for example, what, what the patient password is for. There's no standards on that as well. And I'm trying to get some, some kind of standardization in that. But the that problem sounds like is, a... Uh, that sounds like a very um, good um, question to bring up, and maybe the strategy might want to have a whole section on how to how to uh, ensure continuity of care, and also the way that people can access that one person, whoever that one person is, who would be. I'm the actually producing one. a document. I'm actually at the point of producing how this should work, but then my problem I, is the audience that needs to address. Uh, maybe yeah. I can take this outside this meeting. I think that would be a good <laughs> idea so we can get some more voices in. Um, Robin Sharp, would you like to ask your question? Robin? Oh, yes, Robin. I'm trying to unmute. Yes, thank you. Really, I, my question was for Toby at the very start, which was that it, wouldn't it be a good idea for the whole document to begin as Penny did this meeting? by explaining what the ICB is and its associate uh, acronyms and why it's come into being. Because what are patients supposed to gain by this reorganization of the NHS at eight borough level? Now, that may be mainly as far in the area of hospitals. So maybe we should come on to that later, what people can expect more 
from the present setup than they had before the ICB came into existence. I don't think this relates mainly to primary care because I think primary care, you know, can go on at borough level if, if it's got the leadership. It, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not That's all top down from the ICB. Is it, Kathy? I hope. <laughs> That's a, that's a um, very good suggestion to help navigate people through the strategy so they really understand who does what and why and why where it's going to be improving. We've got a bunch of questions. I'm a little, do we have to move on or can I ask some more people for questions? I think. We've got Dr. I'll, Taylor, one of our GPs, Dr. VJ Taylor on, on with us tonight. So if there were some more questions that um, you'd okay. like to hear from a, a GP on oh, one of our okay. GPs. Could I ask yes. Arnell Thomas? Arnell Thomas has had her hand up for a while. Arnell? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to know, I've just seen one line about end of life. What is the strategy for the ICB on end of life, please? Yeah, I, I can pick this up, uh, Deborah. So it, in, in terms of uh, end of life, obviously in terms of how we manage end of life. There is a end-to-end -end pathway in terms of how we do that in relation to primary care, the community service, and, and secondary care. Um, and, so, and it is absolutely important that all three of those work in a in a common pathway with, with integration. So from a primary care pers perspective, um, we have we do now have the universal care plan, which used to be called Wouldn't My Care. So every patient on the end of life care pathway should have that universal care plan so that every stakeholder, every health professional also um, has access to that patient's care needs and, and in relation to uh, the, what, what is required in, an, in either an urgent setting or in a planned setting. So for instance, um, LAS, London Ambulance Service, 111, UTCs, A&E, have all have access to that universal care plan so that there's a shared common understanding for the end of life care patients needs. We also have our community palliative care nurses that work closely with general practice and primary care to support end of, end of life care patients um, in the community, particularly in relation to their symptom relief that they require in relation to either pain or shortness of breath or constipation, but also in terms of coordinate any other needs that they require, particularly in relation to uh, the community nurses needs, particularly in relation to any of the aids that they require, for instance, a, a hospital bed um, at home, any other appliances okay. that they require, which is um, absolutely important and vital. But also I think in terms we have... of... Sorry, not to cut you off. <laughs> it's okay. Also in terms of access um, of um, home sitting services, uh, particularly in relation to Marie Curie, to support um, relatives and carers in terms of giving them some support and respite in those in those moments when uh, end of car end of life care needs are intensified. I think that we probably have time for one more question in this round before we have to move on to the to the mental health presentation. Um, the next one on my list is uh, Maurice Hoffman. Maurice. Or Meryl Hammer, if Maurice doesn't come on. Meryl? Sorry, just if Morris isn't there. Um, two things quickly. Um, continuity of care, it seems to me, is not the definite. It's a confused definition that's being given. Frequently in the literature, what's being talked about is cont in continuity of care is a relationship between a patient and a doctor, and for very good reason, because a doctor gets to know that, a, a particular doctor gets to know that individual patient and can recognise when things have changed for that patient that a patient themselves may not recognise, and I know that because of, I, I mean, apart from knowing some of the literature, I have seen that in my own household. So I think one needs to be clear about what continuity of care means. And some of the proposals seem to me to move away from 
that link between an individual GP and an individual patient, and we need to be care careful of what the consequences might be in that situation. And that leads me to the second point that I think we need to be aware of. Things were made about an increase of staff, but very few of those are actual increases in GPs. And in fact, um, there are pharmacists, there are physician associates and various other people. But in the news only this week, there was an account of at least one, possibly two deaths because of lack of appro uh, appropriate supervision of people being brought in to GP practices um, and, and because of the additional workload on the GPs left in those practices having to supervise the work of these additional workers. So I think it's a complex position rather than a simple one of getting additional workers. And that has to be taken into account as these new roles are brought in. Otherwise, we're going to have more problems, not ease problems that are already there. I think that's a, a very good point, Meryl. I think we're going to have to move on to the next presentation on, on mental health in the region. I think that's Carolyn Reagan is going to uh, talk us through mental health, learning disabilities and autism. But Meryl, I think your point is very well taken that continuity of care and description of it and how it is going to be addressed should be part of the strategy. Um, thanks, Deborah. Good evening, everybody. I'm Carolyn Regan. I'm the Chief Executive of West London NHS Trust. And for the purposes this evening, I'm the Senior Responsible Officer for Mental Health, Learning Disabilities and Autism. And I'll try going through the slides to make a link with some of the questions and the comments that have been raised in other sections. So one of the things on the on the next slide is obviously everybody has mental health. One of the things that everyone wants is fast access when there is an issue or a problem. And we know that more people and increasingly younger people need help and support from mental health services. Uh, I've also, while we've been talking, pulled some of the data on uh, waiting times, especially in relation to uh, younger people and younger people with eating disorder, which has grown exponentially in the last three years since the pandemic. So on the next um, slide, some of the themes that have uh, come out, um, developing the right support to people in the right place and working very much with the integrated neighbourhood teams, which have been mentioned in the previous section. So all the community mental health teams are now coterminous with the uh, with groups of primary care networks or with one primary care networks, and they work in a much uh, in a much more integrated way. And I think I'm right in saying that GPs do have access to the same uh, to the mental health community team medical records. VJ can correct me. Um, but so the question before was, can GPs see what's happening in in another service? And yes, that is the case in mental health. Um, putting more mental health support teams in schools. So 80, I think it's 80% of schools across Northwest London now have a mental health support service. Um, there's a range of what that means. We're looking to expand that to 100% of schools across Northwest London, but clearly the aim is to support both young people and their families, but also um, parents and families and carers of those young people going to schools in uh, Northwest London. And then the other uh, point on this slide is to develop uh, non-clinical spaces for people to access help and support. So uh, a couple of things I'll just raise there. There's some um, work with uh, MIND. We've opened a young person's drop-in and um, non-clinical space in South Ealing called The Circle. Um, we're obviously monitoring the impact and evaluating the uh, 
um, the effect that it's having, but it is drawing young people who would otherwise um, probably not access mental health services in a less stigmatised way and looking to expand that if we can. And then each of the boroughs have different things called safe spaces or crisis cafes. Um, again, I think we can probably do more to publicise those. They do take uh, self-referrals and they are open for very long hours. We've changed the hours of the ones operating across northwest London, but each of the boroughs have um, one of those and there may be a need for more in the, in the future. Um, in terms of access, I'll just stay on access for a moment. People can self-refer to uh, talking therapies, again, across northwest London, borough-based, and we could send out um, links to, um, to the uh, direct access to talking therapies. And the waits are reasonably quick. So 18-week um, maximum wait, and we're seeing everybody within that time, and there'll be an assessment in a shorter time. And obviously, that's shorter for urgent care. So early intervention services, for example, across Northwest London, 90% of people are seen within uh, two weeks. Um, on the next slide then, I'll just move on to the, the next one. Um, Community-based services for autistic people, um, trying to reduce the reliance on hospital and inpatient beds. And I can see James Davis is on the call, so may want to say something about that. Traditionally, we've referred people out of Northwest London, and obviously what we want to do is to support people both for the assessment and for the community service across Northwest London, much nearer to the place where they live in one of the eight boroughs in Northwest London. Um, I've mentioned alternatives to accident and emergency for those in crisis. Well, there are two 24-7 uh, helplines operating uh, 365 days a year linked to 111. There's about to be a new scheme, which is 111 Press 2 for mental health. They have clinical input as well as uh, more generic call handlers, and they are open to anyone who, who wants to ring. So GPs, other partners, local authorities, neighbours, carers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that's one of the things. Now, there's something um, I'm just going to pick up a point on the right about phone lines are not enough. I, I'm not saying they are enough, but I think they're part of making access and offering wider access to people who have a mental health problem. And the, the feedback is generally quite good. Um, therapeutic spaces to support people in crisis. I've mentioned that mainly through the safe spaces or the crisis cafes, again, often in partnership with third sector organisations or the voluntary sector, um, relatively new. So we need to assess the impact, the hours of operating, but they are open six in some cases, seven days a week and often uh, up to 11 p.m. or midnight. And then um, better support for people waiting for assessment and care. And I think the, the longest wait for assessment and care, the longest waits are actually people work, waiting for um, an autism assessment. And that's where we need to support people who are on the uh, waiting lists. And I think those are the um, happy to to answer questions. A few other things that that we haven't um, mentioned we might want to come back to um, is are the people accessing um, the services representative of the local population? And pleased to say for children and young people, they now are. So the people coming forwards to access um, children and young people's mental health services actually represent the population of Northwest London. And that was not the case a few years ago. And the other good news um, is around the investment that has gone in to mental health and continues to, to go in, but with a big focus on uh, supporting people, better access and helping people get into employment. Someone made a comment earlier about people with mental health problems have more challenge being uh, getting into a job or into training. And we've got a new service which takes referrals direct from uh, GPs and primary care teams and supports people into employment. I'll stop there, Deborah, and uh, answer some questions. Okay, we've got we've got about five questions, um, starting with Gabriella Ramis. Gabriella, would you like to un unmute? Um, can you hear me now? 
Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Hello. yes. Good afternoon. Thank you so Hello. much for this opportunity. I would like just to share three key points as a community support officer for Brent Council for over three years now and supporting specifically the Portuguese and Brazilian community across Brent. It's a challenge when um, immigrants come and to find the route to reach the service. Examples, children with autism, until they find the pathway to reach the assessment, take ages. For example, another issue that I face on a daily basis when they need an emergency appointment um, with the GPs, quite often it's difficult for them to have a translator to support them. And another query that I came quite often and we keep chasing is the way um, the GPs are available to support residents when they come from different countries related to children's immunization. Quite often they miss the vaccines because they cannot understand the, um, the system here, the health system. Think, and, quite often, a... and quite but... often they pass. So my work within the community is making sure that the children have the vaccines up to date, pregnant women's access to the service. Again, since the beginning, I didn't hear, I haven't heard so far, um, improving the services related to the translation services. I think that's a very, very good point, Gabrielle. Please. I hope that's Thank been, you so much. Been, been noted. Um, Kay Gilby. Kay? Thank you. My question relates to this presentation and the previous one. Um, talking about continuation of care, what and can you do anything where someone is in hospital, they're waiting maybe for some adapt adaptations to their home before they can be discharged, and they sit in hospital, bed blocking, waiting for the council to get their rear ends in gear. In all of these, um, you know, things that you're trying to present, is I didn't see anywhere anyone saying the council are going to step up and, that's a, and, that's and, a good support, point. and support you because at the moment it doesn't look like they are that's a very good point um if anyone would like to address the, the relationship between the icb and the council on this particular issue it's not really the mental health side of things but we can move on to another mental mm -hmm. health question I'm happy to come in. I'm happy to come in. So I'm Charlotte. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the North West London. So happy to come in on that. We do a huge amount of work on discharges and discharges exactly care, as you've mentioned, for patients who've got complexity, who need extra support at home, probably different before they went into hospital is a huge area. And part of that's about staffing and having the right staffing for them across social care. And we know that that's a huge challenge for them in terms of workforce, but it's also partly about having the right equipment and actually and we just recently had a change in provider of equipment and a few hiccups around that. But there's a lot of complexities in terms of getting people out smoothly and a huge amount of the, what we did, the work we do and also funding to help support the system cope over winter is looking at how we optimise that discharge. And it's not just health by itself, it's working with the local authorities and it's also working with voluntary sectors. Some people have mentioned them as a really key aid as well. Um, uh, Age UK and other voluntary sectors are also very, very helpful in terms of enabling discharge. Thanks. Um, can we have a Jim Greeley? Is this going to be a mental health question for Carolyn? Jim Greeley. Uh, Carolyn, much of what was said was actually quite interesting, but I couldn't work out the status of it because it was uh, a, a set of discrete points about what's available. But there's actually one thing missing from this section, much more in this section than others, but it goes to others as well. There's actually no figures on need and demand. So it's impossible to work out where in practice you are successful, what the uptake is, what the gaps are. And without that, what you haven't got is a strategy. One's got a, a wish list. And I think this is of crucial importance in terms of credibility, because credibility actually does mean that you know where you are, you can point out with facts where you are, you know the means for getting elsewhere. And let me take one part of that to <laughs> exemplify. It's the workforce part. People continually say, as the last person did, quite honestly, 
a workforce is a challenge, does that not mean you don't have the staff and you'd like the staff, and I know you're working to get staff, but they aren't available. The national figures make that clear. Would it not be much better to say in practice what actually is successful and what you cannot do because of lack of staff? Because then you'll have far more credibility. We know there are large delays. I think, they, I think we're going to ask Carolyn to. Carolyn can come in on on this one. Carolyn. OK, thanks, Deborah. Um, can can I go back two questions and then I'll come on to Jim's question yeah. about uh, workforce? Sure. So um, uh, the, the woman made a point about supporting various communities, and I think it goes for mental health services as well as everything else. There is something about outreaching into those services, not waiting for people to come to us. And that's increasingly something that we are doing and need to do more of. And then I think there's something about support the ICB supporting local voluntary sector organizations which again I think is work in progress to help with that outreach work so I think those are those are you quoted the Brazilian and Portuguese communities but it could go for many other communities across northwest London second thing someone asked about local authorities I mean none of this mental health included could be possible without partnership with a wide range of organizations including local authorities and housing just in terms of mental health and uh, physical health absolutely crucial so we work very closely in partnership with the local authorities in relation to housing and clearly that's a national challenge not just in in northwest london um jim's point about demand and need as you know we're working on a, a northwest london mental health strategy which will be based on the long-term plan and various national initiatives and part of that will be demand and need so what's the population now what's the demand for mental health and what's the demand and need going forwards and then the last point workforce well we now have an NHS workforce strategy and our job is to translate it into jobs that are attractive to people um, who want to come and work in northwest London and a big plug for mental health and learning disability and clearly we need to train more people so that we um, encourage them to work here and um, study here and stay here. Thank you, Carolyn. There was one question in the chat that intrigued me as well. It was about the police and how the police are not going to um, answer mental health calls anymore. Yeah. How is that going to yeah. affect your work? And is that so, part of the strategy? Um, it is part of the mental health crisis care strategy, and everyone will have read some quite concerning comments by the Metropolitan Police uh, a couple of months ago about stopping. It was tr it was interpreted by the media as stopping all mental health work. That's not actually the case. And there is a planned programme of work to try and streamline what happens to people in crisis across London. And I was at a meeting this morning with very senior people from the Metropolitan Police looking at uh, how we work together on people who need to be admitted under a section of the Mental Health Act or who need a welfare check or various other things. Um, and one of the things we were really pushing for was to have some clear communications, because I know this is quite concerning to many, many people. Um, that They initially said it all stops from 1st of August. That's not actually the case, but we need to get on and, and put those joint communications out. Um, the police said clearly if, if there's a risk to self or others, then we'll continue to respond to um, mental health calls and they they gave the example where they they've implemented new systems in other parts of the country and they do still respond in a large number of cases but clearly communicating with everybody is part of what we need to do in the next two weeks okay um we have a question from james davies hi uh, it's not necessarily a question it's more of a comment um Sorry, I work with Carolyn, um, so I'm the head of nursing for integrated care services. Just on the question of autism assessments, just to, to, we will be seeing a lot more um, advancements in this over the course of the next 12 months. All of these services have been co-produced and they're quite expertly run. So we're hoping to see great advancements in those. And just another couple of questions about the learning disability work. There will be the Oliver McGowan training, which will be kind of music to a lot of parents' ears, that there'll be mandatory training for all care, healthcare professionals on learning disabilities and autism within our acute sector and within our community sector, within mental health, our GPs, everyone 
anyway. So we're hoping to see great advancements in people's knowledge with those um, with those things. So they are just a couple of updates from our side and kind of learning species and autism that you can expect to see over the months. Thank, thank you, James. Um, I think we have time for one more question before we have to move along. Uh, it's it's Dorni, Dorni, Dornia from the Romanian Society. Oh yeah, Dorina, hi. Thank hi, you, everyone. Dorina, sorry. No worry. Uh, it was just, um, I want to ask, about actually we had a case with, uh, I think clearly for me, the gentleman was with mental health. And you mentioned, Caroline, that there is, um, yeah, um, you have a team which uh, they are dealing with mental health uh, people. So this gentleman came to us there, even though we, we are helping just Romanian community that, uh, with translating and all sorts of things. There are many other people collecting food from our hub. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself, sorry. <laughs> so we are a Romanian hub and the best in Haro, just to, to start with. And uh, this person is from other from different um, community. And he just came with a, a board and asking for uh, housing because he was moved from one organization oh, to another yeah. and he was asking. Definitely to me, that person was with mental health. And when I told him that I can refer him to other organizations, he was just getting so mad. And he said, I'm going to put myself in front of the car and I'm going to maybe police like this will see me and all, all that sort of stuff. And I said, can I call on your behalf and can I help? And he just ran out. Support because he was mentioning that he's been to GP, he's been to other organizations, he's been to his CAB. How can we support this type of uh, client? So uh, I didn't catch your name, but I got the gist of your question. Can, can you hear? Okay. Yes. All right. OK, um, I think there's some very um, relatively straightforward um, training that we can make available for community organisations. And actually, we did this for um, the staff working in local MPs offices across northwest London. So how do you work with people who um, uh, maybe turn up and uh, the staff don't have the the knowledge or the um, the background and what are the simple things we can do to to help you manage those sometimes very tense difficult situations and often they're not just about mental health they're about a whole load of things um, cost of living and housing and other, you know personal relationships and all the rest of it but I think I'm looking at Olivia but we could certainly put something on for all organizations who wanted to um, patch into something like that just to learn some some skills and some um kind of um de-escalation ways of um increasingly dealing with people who have multiple issues and who maybe go from organization to organization and it can be quite challenging for for, for, for people and volunteers and others who are working yeah. in them so we can do that thank you thank Happy you very to much pick, to pick that up carolyn and and to work with our community organizations to do some of that delivery that would be really positive thank you that's a good point. I think now we're going to move on to the to the third section about acute care. Is that back to Toby? Yes, it is, I'm afraid. So two apologies. Uh, first of all, Robin, I didn't wasn't deliberately attempting to dodge your question by uh, my connection dying when you asked, but we'll come back to that and then to everybody else, because it's the third time you've had to put up with me this evening. Um, so let's have a look at some of our urgent emergency care, particularly sort of hospital care. Um, so we've got a number of sort of presenting issues here. Um, so the main one is that people are waiting too long for both emergency care and for planned care. And you can see that in our uh, sort of elective and uh, sort of outpatient waiting times. And you can see that in the amount of time people spend sort of waiting in A&E. Um, in order to sort of address that, there's a number of things we're doing, but it's broadly improving access to specialist care and improving how we provide those uh, that urgent and emergency care. Um, on the specialist care side, uh, we've historically really had a model which is basically saying, well, our specialist uh, doctors in particular are a limited resource, and therefore we're going to sort of reserve them for the people who are sickest. And hence you get this uh, slightly odd dynamic of uh, so here you are. Oh, you're not quite sick enough for the specialist person yet. You're not quite sick enough for the specialist person yet. Oh, now you are really sick. 
um, we'll get you to the specialist person. Um, and what we've increasingly realised over time is it's actually more cost effective and better for patient care for a little bit of specialist input to come in early, um, which means that people don't escalate and become sicker so later on. And we'll come into a number of the ways in which we're trying to do that in just a moment. Um, secondly, then on this sort of improving sort of urgent and emergency care, and we've had a number of questions in relation to this in regards to sort of primary care. In the first section, we've had a couple of questions in relation to sort of crisis care, which is another form of urgent and emergency care, so it's slightly more sort of mental health sort of focused in the previous bit. And really what we see if we look across urgent and emergency care at the moment is that it is quite a complex landscape of uh, sort of multiple sort of different services. So whether they be sort of single points of access and sort of mental health, calling the police, um, get, getting onto your GP surgery, A and E, 111, extended hours from uh, sort of general practice, urgent treatment centres, um, so 999, and probably walk-in centres, and quite there's, there's just quite a lot of things here. And what we actually see is that some of those services at the moment are quite heavily quite heavily used, so more people turn up than they can cope with. Um, so A and E would be a particular example of that. It's not the only one, but quite a number of those services are not nearly as heavily used. And actually, we have quite a bit of spare capacity in those services. So there is a bit here about how we bring the resource which is sitting behind our urgent and emergency care system more into line with uh, where the demand is presenting um, and or sort of guide people more effectively to the uh, sort of the right place um, for their uh, urgent need to be dealt with. Um, that last one is easy to say, it's quite hard to do because most people know for an urgent need, you can go to A&E, you can ring the police or you can uh, if phone your GP. And given we keep changing the rest of the landscape on a fairly regular basis, it's quite hard for anybody to keep their keep in their head. Um, for this particular need, I need to go there. For that particular need, I need to go there. But it also requires us to have quite a stable system and so, so that people can um, understand and get used to this is actually where we need to need to go for the different things. So if we go on to the next slide, please wait. So that therefore means we're doing a number of things in uh, across this uh, so urgent emergency care and sort of acute sort of landscape. So as I said, making sure that we have timely access to specialist doctors expertise when when we need it. That manifests in a number of ways. So we've heard Kathy talking about those integrated neighbourhood teams. Um, those have uh, sort of hospital doctors sort of plugged into them so that uh, that expertise when it's needed is available through primary care rather than people necessarily having to be sort of referred on to hospital. Um, so that gets rid of some of that outpatient weight. Um, not appropriate for everyone, but often sort of quite helpful. Um, we already do that quite a bit in Northwest London through uh, things like child health hubs, which are currently unavailable in about half of our boroughs and bring paediatricians out. Um, we do it a bit with sort of geriatricians as well, some of the specialists sort of mental health through the uh, mental health integrated neighbourhood teams, but we don't do it systematically across a wide range of services. So that's part of it. And the second is uh, what we call a sort of same day emergency care sort of in hospitals. Um, so again, there's been a bit of a tendency over the years to if we if the uh, sort of the person seeing some if the uh, doctor seeing somebody doesn't quite have the right specialist expertise to sort of address sort of their need. So instantly then the default is to admit them and pe once people are in a hospital bed, they then tend to stay there for quite a while. Um, but if we can do get them seen by the appropriate specialist on the same day, um, normally sitting in a chair next to the emergency department. Uh, so rather than uh, actually being admitted onto a bed, that quite often means that they can go home on the same day and be cared for better at home. So that's what we're trying to do there. Um, secondly, then uh, sort of reducing sort of waiting times for surgery, and there's a fair bit sort of stream. So we know the uh, sort of the waiting times for um, sort of inpatient surgery have gone up sort of hand over fist over. And the last years uh, went down a bit during COVID because we had less people referred. We've gone up very sharply since uh, now at record levels. 
quite a lot of this is about how we streamline sort of the pathway. So a number of you will have seen that we have a um, we consulted on an elective orthopaedic centre to basically dedicate some resource and dedicate some space to elective surgery um, for those with uh, needing sort of hip and knee replacements in particular. Um, we could do more of that for other common conditions, likely to be things like eyes, sort of ear, nose and throat stuff and so on, um, so that we can sort of do that sort of more extensively. Um, and then that should bring down our sort of waiting times. Um, in the next thing which sits on the uh, pathway which stops people getting to surgery as quickly as they might do is um, the sort of diagnostic tests. Um, again, there's more we can do to streamline that. In particular, reconfiguring how our staff work on that. And I think there was a question in the chat about being worried about sort of AI triage and so on. Um, but we can also bring quite a lot of uh, uh, sort of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning into the di diagnostic tests because it's something like sort of 70 to 80 percent of scans are pretty obvious and you can teach a machine to read them and that means therefore means that we can concentrate our radiologists and so on on reading the uh, 20 to 30 percent of scans which really require a human to look at them we can increase the capacity of our sort of radiologists by sort of more than half and increase Hence the uh, um, increase or decrease is the word I'm looking for that and decrease the amount of time it takes for people to get that um, sort of diagnosis and hence get um, into uh, sort of the uh, necessary uh, sort of elective care. Um, so improving the urgent emergency care service, I talked a bit about this already and Cathy touched on some of it in the uh, out of hospital space. But ultimately, it's a confusing landscape, multiple different touch points, lots of people bounce around it and we know that the resource is not um, lined up against where the demand is presenting. So bringing that sort more into line will help on that. And then sort of lastly, um, it is things are different. So sort of no matter where you are in northwest London, and some of that is a legacy of having had sort of eight different uh, clinical commissioning groups and four four different uh, sort of hospital trusts. And this is really about getting northwest London to think about these services as a northwest London sort of wide service so that uh, we can uh, you get the basic well, if I take this as a practical example so Hillingdon for example has a more limited sort of pediatric sort of offer than that sort of Imperial or the Chelsea and Westminster just because they're a smaller hospital and they don't employ quite as many staff and the ones they've got are still pretty good so I'm not knocking them um, but if uh, one of the specialists happens to be off sick or uh, on holiday on a particular day, there's less resilience in the service. So we can bring the uh, staff across from Imperial and Chelsea Westminster to ensure that uh, that same level of service is sort of maintained no matter where you access our acute trusts across northwest London. Um, so that's all I'm going to say on acute care or hospital care. And again, I think we're over to questions. Thank you, Toby. Um, we have a question from Mrs. Raisa. Mariah, are you on? Could you unmute yourself? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, sorry, I just I came late because uh, I'm just coming from work. Um, I like what everyone uh, is saying. However, I wanted to mention something concerning, um, you know, I um I personally think that the Northwest London also have to work hard to improve, you know, their care on um on supporting the young parents and first time parents. I'll give my own example. Um, I had my daughter six years ago, and uh, I was told by the midwife that she would have um issues with um you know with her tongue. Basically, she was born with a tongue tie. So I was told from the beginning that there'll be a bit of a speech delay. And I was told that I have to, before she go through an operation, I need to speak to the GP so they can write a letter for me and, uh, or, you know, for her to go under an operation. So when I went to see my GP, I was told by the GP that I didn't have to worry about anything because she was quite chubby. So she was eating well and uh, she was chubby. The GP looked at her and said, oh, so, she's fine. So would your question, is your question going to be about how 
how to how to get to the right place at the right time and the access not just the access but i want us to also work on on helping um helping first-time parents the reason why i'm saying this is because i was a first-time mom yeah. and i struggled with my daughter yeah, so when I, I went to the GP to get help, I didn't get the help that I was expecting. Yeah. So right. I think that's part of the first program that that to Toby was saying that there's going to be a, a focus on on children, and okay. let's hope that 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 your concerns like yours are listened to. I think that's very very important, Mrs. Mariah. Okay. Very important. Thank you very much for your question, um, James Guest. Thank you. Um, it's about emergency care. The ambulance service performs an absolutely vital role in the chain of emergency care. And it's quite clear there are wide inequalities in how long it takes an ambulance to reach a caller. Um, some boroughs have better response times, others have vastly worse. And this is true for all the different, there are four categories of ambulance response times. Um, now, Northwest London ICB actually commissions the London Ambulance Service, and a while back, the London Ambulance Service used to produce a monthly performance report which showed by borough how long it took for each of the four categories of emergency for an ambulance to reach. Now, the news is not, the performance is no longer as good as it used to be, and the ambulance service have decided to stop publishing that information. Now, for all strategic planning, and I was a strategic planner for many years, you rely on performance monitoring data. So what is the ICB, Northwest London ICB, as the employer of a London ambulance service on behalf of all of London, going to do to give them a site prod, putting it politely, to start resuming, publish this absolutely essential performance information? Because right now we can see there are incredible variations. And I mean, one's relying at present on FRI requests, okay. which is a shame. That, thank you, James. Uh, Toby, would you like to try that one? Um, yes, short answer is not really, but I'll give it a go. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so you're quite right. We do commission sort on an ambulance service. Um, so they should be producing this. Um, we continue to, uh, um, so I harassed them and so I harangued them into sort of producing it. Um, I will come back to you when we've got a time frame out of them for it to sort of reappear, James. Now we have um, four more questions. Uh, to, um, Rory, do we have time for those questions? So we're due to finish at 7.30. It depends um, how, how long people are, <laughs> are willing to stay and how people have got, really. So I suppose we, we could probably take a couple more, Two more questions we? and i know okay. that i know that um we want some closing remarks as well but... yeah all right sandra williams thank you my question is will consultants have an in-house service to refer patients to other services rather than referring back out back in the day 26 years ago this was done so a consultant maybe rheumatologists wanted a patient to see a diabetes um, consultant simply referred that patient and and that was the quick way of getting that patient seen is that going to be taken back on board in this new system that you're talking about because this new system seems so much long-winded with the services we have already, why not improve those services rather than going back and starting something totally new? That's my my opinion. Would who would like to talk to that? Okay. Consultants referrals. Can I come in there? I mean, I don't know if Charlotte's still on the call. Yeah, I am. Um, oh, you're probably better than me then, Charlotte. You go. <laughs> Yeah, happy to. Thank you. So I mean, it's a really important point. So what we make it trying to make the system much more permissive and smoother. So if you your problem, if you get referred to someone to a consultant or a doctor in the hospital, they can't sort out your problem. You need to be referred to another service. So say you have 
pelvic pain, it might you might go to a gastroenterology and said it needs to go to gynecology. They're able, we're enabling them to make those referrals. The example you gave, um, where it might be say going seeing a rheumatologist and being asked to um, refer directly to to somebody who specialises in diabetes. The, um, the hospital doctors don't always understand the full range that general practice can actually deal with, and most of those conditions are dealt with and in a more appropriate time frame in general practice. So what we're saying is if it's a problem not related to the referral, ask your GP, then your GP can assess and see whether it's appropriate to go back in the system. Otherwise, the risk is that we then clog up the system with lots of lots of referrals that would be dealt with in a much more timely fashion and also very appropriately by your GP. So this would be part. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, the reason I asked because I worked for the NHS and that system worked 26 years ago. There was a quick referral system for patients from one um, consultant referral to another, rather than having to go back out of the system and restart again. Okay. Hence, why listening to everyone what they're saying, it's it's just mind boggling that we're doing this system wasting money when patients just want to see their GP or face to face rather than virtual communication, which is not working. I think that's it's, a point that um, that we have we tried to address in certain ways. I don't know whether the strategy will go all the way to doing that. Um, we're now up to our time. We have um, Nayela who has a question, then Jeffrey and then Jim, and then we'll, Jim Greeley, then we'll, then we'll close off and get the final remarks. Um, Nayella. Oh, hi, hi everyone. Um, I was just actually um, just, um, I, I guess it's, um, it's, it's referring back to the mental health slides, um, the presentation that was actually done earlier. And um, I just wanted just to kind of highlight or, or raise awareness. Um, I used to work in Brent. In fact, I'm a resident within Brent and I used to work in Brent as a care coordinator uh, within the mental health um, community teams, um, adult services. And a lot of the time when people, you know, often present with mental health issues, you know, it comes with a lot of complexities. Either they've got adult social care issues, they've got um, alcohol and drug problems, domestic violence, no recourse for public funds, um, you know, um, depression, you know, psychosis, everything, you know, you name it. And services within Brent are quite limited. And I think from from myself, you know, working, I guess, across the globe, um, I came from Lambeth at that stage and um, then, you know, worked in Brent because obviously it was better for me in terms of its locality. And just noticing the disproportion of services that were available mm -hmm. to clients and of course you know that disabled me to do my job properly and I then think that's a, that's a good point yeah. I think that's a good point that it comes into the issue about funding and equality of care um Jeffrey do you want to ask a question yeah I'm just trying to can you hear me yes uh to Mr Lambert, please. Um, you mentioned in urgent and emergency care, you've got some space that you're able to use elsewhere. The first question, where's this space? The second thing is, are there any plans or thoughts anywhere to close hospitals? And number three, all change when labour gets in. Thank you. So let me take those in reverse order, Geoffrey. Um, oh, it will change when Labour gets in. Um, well, your guess is almost as good as mine. And we've had some chats with the uh, um, Labour's um, sort of shadow health secretary, and he's got some particularly uh, sort of interesting ideas, uh, yeah. sort of many of which are around uh, sort of challenging what he perceives as vested interests and possibly even going as far as closing hospitals and so on, if they're not the uh, sort of most appropriate place to be sort of delivering care from. But at present, mm -hmm. to reassure you on that point, um, we have no plans to close any of our sort of hospitals in sort of northwest London at this point. Um, wow. We do have plans to change what some of the services offered by those hospitals are, uh, you know, sort of 
the needs of our population change and the technology moves on and we yeah. can't sort of preserve our hospitals doing exactly the same thing as yeah. they've always done but at this point there is no plan to close any of those uh, sort of hospital sites yeah. and where's the space you mentioned and where's the well, space which department so um the space so the if you look at the utilisation of our hospitals, I, this is a very could be a very long answer, so Jeffrey. But actually, quite a lot of our hospitals are um, so underutilised in terms of the overall space, so which they have. Um, the issue is that quite a lot of the space is not very easily adaptable at the moment to sort of patient use. Right. Um, if you then look at a number of our sort of newer buildings, so you could take um, yeah. sort of the Park View sort yeah. of medical centre yeah. in um, so yeah. 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 So Northern Hammersmith, and yeah. yeah. um, you actually look at the amount of time those rooms are used, then they're used for a bit less than sort of half the week over the uh, course yeah. of the week. So, and I could give you a talk more and more examples of that. So there's thing. lots going on there's, there. So there's quite so, a bit of space which we can bring into sort of better use than we currently have. So Thank final question. Ma'am. Final question will be from Jim Greeley, um, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair, for calling me. Um, uh, Toby was actually very interested in quite a lot in that section. Um, I I'm sure we all share his ambition that hospital beds should. Um, should not be overoccupied um, much of the time, but in practice they are. And the key thing must be about bed availability, but itself uh, is dependent on actual discharge. And although we've mentioned discharge a number of times um, this evening during this meeting, I've not seen any um, detailed quality report on discharge practice across Northwest London, and particularly the, the adequacy of the discharge um, packages in practice from a patient point of view, so that people may feel they're being rushed out of hospital, they get box ticked with one visit and they're back in quickly or their health declines. So it's a question there about quality review, which takes into co-production from a patient's point of view of the adequacy of the discharge packages as they exist, so we can move on to better ones. Thank you, Jim. Toby. Yes, I'm not too sure there was a, a question in there, Jim, as opposed to an observation that uh, you would actually quite like to see something um, which speaks directly to that. Um, yep, have I got that right? I think that was the case, yes. I think yep. that it was okay. the case that to, to note that there isn't communication on discharge practices and maybe best practice for discharge practices and how to improve them. Yeah. So, um, I guess we've come to the end of this session and shall I hand it first back to Penny to give some closing remarks and then I'll do a few closing remarks. Okay, so first of all, uh, massive, massive thanks to all of you for joining tonight um, and not just for joining and listening, but also being active participants in a conversation. So reading the comments in the chat function, hearing the questions, hearing the comments, hearing the observations, I find myself nodding vociferously. So I am in you know, stark agreement with, with many uh, of, of the comments that are being made. And uh, to a degree, it's my job to work with all of my uh, colleagues, um, a number of whom are obviously joined this this evening, to really essentially to do many of the things that you are all asking for and you're suggesting. So, you know, it's good to see uh, a high degree of consensus um, around all of that. I think for me, the big, you know, themes I've heard, first of all, largely support for the uh, high level direction of the strategy. Uh, I would actually say to, as Toby said, I, I'm not sure we will see much difference in any political party in the overall strategy of health and care services in this country. You wouldn't see much difference if you went to most other Western countries. You know, everybody is uh, dealing with the same challenges, wanting to focus more on prevention, wanting to get more upstream, as it were, and have far better, more responsive community services to reduce the need for people to spend lots, lots of time in hospital to improve discharge processes. Uh, to use digital technologies uh, more effectively, to have a workforce that's uh, 
better trained, better supported, better able to meet needs and so on and so forth. So that broad direction of travel is there. As a number of you have said in the chat function and in your comments, the devil is in the detail. Absolutely it is. And so while we can set out that broad direction of travel, what we absolutely need to do is to start to put a lot more detail behind that. We absolutely need numbers around this, numbers around what do we believe the needs are of the population of Northwest London? What is the demand? Where is that unmet demand? What are the services and, and how many services do we need doing what sorts of things in what sorts of buildings with what sorts of workforce and so on? And where do we get to in terms of the um, financials around that? So we do have a defined pot of money. Uh, again, it's our job collectively to think through how we spend that money in the most effective way to deliver against the objectives of improving health, ensuring high quality care and reducing inequalities in health. So that's what we're all trying to do. Um, it's, as I say, as, as I started, really good to hear all the comments and all of the input. Um, we do hold our board meetings in public. There is one uh, a week today and you will hopefully, you know, if those of you who want to uh, listen into that will hear more of the detail of the sorts of things that we've been talking about this evening. But the conversation continues. Uh, great to hear everything tonight and look forward to hearing more comments in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Penny. Um, I just have a couple of uh, observations. I think the message that came through clearly to me, listening to people's questions, was communication. We need really, really clear communication about how this strategy might be put into practice. We need uh, information about the funding for it. That's still very much up in the air. We also need um, to try and rid us of the acronyms and the and the and the things like that so that people understand where to go to get the information they need. And I think that, that would, that's a, a really big um, part of the uh, problem, problem of understanding what the strategy can deliver. I would now like to put in a plug for the patient participation groups because this is where a, a wonderful way for getting information to your local practice about what the needs of the patients are and what's working and what's not. So we have a now a Northwest London forum for patient participation groups. And I would encourage anybody on this call who's obviously very interested in what's going on in healthcare to join their patient participation group and ask that, that group to become part of our forum because we can then feed back to uh, various people w within health in Northwest London, the needs of the patients so that we do have a uh, very um, good ways of communicating backwards and forwards. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it back to Rory. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for, for participating and for your contributions. Thanks very much, Deborah. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. And just we will publish those questions on the website. And, and if you if you want us to send the questions, drop us a line. If you want to send us the questions by email, do, do email the, the address, which I'll ask um, one of the team to put in the chat now. Yeah, it's um, already right else. at the start of the it's, chat. It's been in the chat. OK, thank you. I don't think I've got anything else to add. I want to thank Penny and Deborah for sharing, which I know was, was quite tricky with so many questions and so many people. Sorry if we didn't get to your particular question tonight, but we will respond to all the questions on the website. So thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.